door for me, Jerry? Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome to step three. I'm glad that you're here. So welcome to step three. Um, in, uh, to recap, uh, step one, ah! many things going on, many things I don't know how to do, all kinds of unmanageability and powerlessness. And we talked about the nine areas of unmanageability in the big book of AA. Um, step two, you know, we come to believe, right? We come to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. Doesn't even matter what that power looks like. It just matters that we've got one and that we no longer re uh, regard ourselves as the ultimate <coughs> authority in our lives. So step two. Step three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Um, it's kind of a, to me, this is kind of one of the rubber meets the road step. It's a really, really important step. Um, the other, the first two steps are sort of more about thinking and maybe some writing and some reflection and some figuring out what's going on with us and with our lives. But step three is an action step. We make a decision, right? to turn our will and our lives over to the power of God as we understood him. Um, the spiritual principles that I recognize in step three are willingness. We just have to make a start, right? Willingness and humility. Um, Al-Anon's, uh, speaking of myself as an Al-Anon, used to running the show, kind of, used to making the decisions, used to being the one. Um, when I showed up here, things were really, really, really tough for me just lots of despair but giving my will up was a big step for me um, and the people in my group really helped me to make that decision again because I could tell when I listened to them that they had a solution that I did not have and I needed a solution I really really needed a solution so I think we're gonna open tonight by actually doing some reading from the big book we're going to read quite a bit out of the big book tonight, so I thought it might be good to pass the book around and we could kind of take turns reading so you hear other voices other than me. Um, so we're going to start on page 58, which is the chapter called How It Works. This is my favorite chapter. As I pass the book around, you may notice that it's underlined in all kinds of wild colors and notes everywhere. So. Um, I'm going to start with the reading, and then uh, we're going to skip reading the steps out loud because I don't think we need to do that. But then we're going to read straight through this to page 63. Um, whoever's got the book, when it's their turn, uh, We Were Reborn is kind of where we're going to end on this reading on page 63. So I'll get started. So this chapter in the big book of AA is called Chapter 5, How It Works. Um, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Now, I referenced that last week. Anybody remember what I said about it? Who wants to say? Never. 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 So, allegedly, this might be apocryphal, I don't know for sure, but allegedly Bill W. was asked if he'd change anything in the big book, and this is the one word he said that he would change. He would change. Rarely have we seen a person fail who, have th who has thoroughly followed our path to never, never have we seen it fail. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program, usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. Isn't that interesting? There are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. So it's kind of a preview into one of the things that's going to be demanded of us, rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave, uh, mental and mental, uh, grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Um, has it, have most of you read that before? Yeah, it's pretty powerful, isn't it? Um, what that says, there's a lot of sort of PowerPoints um, in this part of the chapter. 
for me, um, I think that it, that at first it tells us that if we show up, like someone in my Al-Anon used to, group used to say, suit up, show up, do the next right thing. Like that's pretty basic, right? So put your clothes on, <laughs> go to a meeting, right? And be open-minded and maybe get some new ideas about what you should be doing. Um, so rarely or never have we seen this process fail. When it does fail, it fails because people either cannot or will not be very honest. Have you worked steps and been sort of like taken aback by what you learned about yourself? <laughs> Yikes, right? Um, but what I like to say about that is you cannot change anything that you cannot see. If you're in denial, right, don't even know I am lying denial, and you can't see something, you will remain powerless over that thing, right? You have to be able to see it in order to change it. It's really important. Um, and then t we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas and the result, result was nil until we let go absolutely. My sponsor refers to the third step as a contract with God. Like we're signing up, right? We're signing on the dotted line. We're agreeing that we are not gonna run the show anymore, that we are gonna be open to new ideas and open to the guidance of a higher power. Now, when people are frightened, their access to God can be limited or even blocked by their fear. That's why we do this together, right? Because the stuff that I'm carrying and working with is not likely to frighten you, right? Your stuff is likely to not frighten me. So we work together um, as a way to overcome fear and to create open-mindedness and willingness. I already told you guys I'm a bossy sponsor and that's a true statement. One of my sponsees was in this meeting on the first step when I said that and she guffawed. It was an honest guffaw <laughs> and it was an appropriate guffaw, right? It was appropriate. Why is that? So in our meetings we don't believe in gossip and crosstalk, not appropriate in a meeting, but if you've brought on a sponsor and you're working together to discover the truth, it's gonna be essential to your recovery that that sponsor be fearless and thorough with you, and that that sponsor be able to tell you, like it's why I get the big bucks, I say, which is no bucks at all, right? <laughs> it's because I pay, I pay acute attention to what my sponsees tell me. Like all of the time I'm listening carefully to what they're saying. Why do I do that? So that in the areas where they're afraid, powerless, and things are unmanageable, I can give them suggestions about what to do. That's appropriate for a sponsor to do. They don't have to do what I ask them to do. Every, free will, right? But the, the, the suggestions a sponsor gives are based on the information that you give that sponsor. And it's, um, it's not that the sponsor, it's not that I'm right and the other person's wrong. It's that I'm not afraid and the other person is. Mm -hmm. So it isn't even like that the advice is perfect or the advice is whatever. <laughs> it's more about you want to do all these old things that you do and I'm aware of that and I'm going to point you a different direction and I'm going to suggest that you do things that you don't normally to do in an effort to change really the trajectory of your recovery. And as we work steps around our issues, we will need to practice, practice being different in our recovery, right? Because to change the direction that we're headed is a difficult thing to do. Um, neurologists actually say that we wear pathways in our brain so our repetitive, over and over again, frightened defense mechanisms, our thoughts that create the behavior, that create the problems, our thoughts and beliefs come first, 
then comes behavior, and then almost immediately you're going to get feedback on whether you're in God's will or not with that behavior, right? So to change that is difficult. And so one of the things that we do in recovery is we stay in the work and we practice, practice, practice. I say stay with it till you're different. I told a sponsee recently, she had all kinds of issues at work, and I'm like, she wanted to quit really badly, but these people were teaching her such valuable things about herself, right? Like it was a rich, deep environment for her to be in. And I said to her, you can quit that job when you like it. As soon as you like that job. <laughs> if you wanna go, you know, then you can go. That might sound harsh, right? What I was trying to get her to see that her issues with bosses, coworkers, the way things were run, the things that were happening that triggered her all the time, that if she could stay with that till she was a different person, a different person herself, that those things would die down or stop. And it happened. She just told me recently, I love my job, can I go get a different one? <laughs> like, yeah, you can, congratulations. <laughs> Um, because she doesn't need that anymore, right? And it's not about increasing people's pain. It's about making sure they stay with something till they're different, right? Like my, the people that run the company I work for, and it's a nonprofit. Nonprofits are interesting. They have their own quirky, weird stuff that, that's very nonprofit world. Um, when I changed me, my problems that I was having at work went away. They just, they just went away. It was the coolest thing ever. So half mu measures avail us nothing, okay? Remember when we talked last week about courage being the dividing line between what hurts us and what heals us, right? Half measures avail us nothing. We're at a turning point. We asked his help. Then it goes through the 12 steps, um, which we're not to be discouraged about. Then it gives kind of the step one through three summary. Um, <laughs> that we were al and could ma not manage our own lives, that probably no human power could have relieved us from our troubles, and that God could and would if God were sought. It's really beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. So we are seeking in step three a relationship with our higher power, and we have just enough willingness usually and humility to surrender our will, to stop being the one who's directing, and to get some new ideas about not, not only our behavior, but especially as we talk about the four step, it is what we believe to be true about what's happening that is the problem, okay? It's not what's happening that's the problem. Like the things that trigger my sponsees at work, I say to them, could another human being, do you think, walk through this with little or no difficulty? Yeah, maybe, right, maybe. So it's not what's happening that's the issue. It's what you believe to be true about what's happening, that it means something about you that is distasteful to you, that you're bad, that you're not loved, that you're not worthy, that you'll never be enough, that you're not safe. When those beliefs get triggered, are defensive, usually, usually learned in childhood, childhood, mm. um, those behaviors we took on in childhood to make ourselves feel better get triggered, right? And we behave poorly. <laughs> um, frightened people are the most dangerous people on the planet because a person who's badly frightened enough becomes a dangerous human being, right? Fear is dangerous. So by making this agreement with our higher power that we're, n we're done, man, we're done running the show. We're gonna submit ourselves to this. We're gonna be disciplined enough to submit ourselves to this program. And um, call down the thunder. My sponsor calls it, call down the thunder. You know, there's lots of love out there. There's lots of power out there. When I don't have it, it's a personal problem. Right? It's a personal problem. So call down the thunder. Step three, we call down the thunder. We say, okay. And then we try it and we see what happens next, which is the cool part too. 
La la la, I love this line, any line, any life run on self will can hardly be a success, right? So I don't know why I'm different maybe from other people on the planet. <coughs> I don't know why when I run the show myself it goes badly. And you know what, I don't even care anymore. I just don't care. For me, when I'm in self will and fear, things go very poorly. When I surrender, um, you must surrender to win. It opens me up to new ideas, new behaviors, new thoughts, new beliefs, and things start going better for me. I also like that they talk about um, our actor might maybe sometimes quite virtuous. <laughs> That cracks me up. He may be kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest and self-sacrificing. To me, that's describing Al-Anon people. To me, that's like a description of the people in Al-Anon. Um, what this book says, though, what usually happens, the show doesn't come off very well. Why? Because don't, people don't recognize me as the ultimate authority on everything. And they don't want to do what I want them to do. I can't imagine why. <laughs> I'm, so, I, I'm so smart about that stuff. So then what happens? Then we get resentful, right? We get angry. We get indignant. We get, for me, self-righteousness was a big one. Like, I, w I would get so offended. Like, so offended. <laughs> it, the way people didn't cooperate with me. Um, and in his best moments, is he not a producer of confusion rather than harmony? And then it goes on to talk about becoming egocentric. If the other people would only behave, we would be okay, right? Selfishness and self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our problem. For me as an Al-Anon, I want the other people to behave so that I will feel better. That's ultimately selfish, right? <laughs> Adults have free will. You know, even when we have children, I had a cousin ask me one time, um, her, her kids were quite a bit younger than mine. She goes, well, how did you get your kids to do what you wanted them to do? I'm like, oh my God, you're talking to the wrong cousin here. <laughs> Go talk to those cousins over there. They're way better at that than I am because I was aware years ago that once your kids are a certain age, hopefully you've built a foundation of trust and unconditional love and they'll, they might care about what you think when they're 14 or 15. They might not, right? Mm -hmm. But trying to control other people, even our children, is an exercise in frustration. It just doesn't work. Um, and then I like this chapter too. We had to quit playing God or this paragraph, it did not work. We decided that from here on out, God was gonna be the director. He is, our, he is the principal, we are his agents. He is the father, we are his children. Most good ideas are simple, and this concept was the keystone to a new and triumphant arch through which we pass to freedom. <coughs> freedom, friends, freedom. When we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things happened. That has been true for me all sorts like when we talked about step two last week I said aim high <laughs> so step one this is what's not working this is what un unmanageability and powerless looks like step two we asked the question if my higher power were really in charge of this if love was in charge of this mess what might it look like right and and I said aim big because when we really surrender to this kind of a of a process, all kinds of remarkable things start to happen. And I want you to really get that. Um, in thinking about step three, I found some, I went through, I was going through my writing the last couple of weeks and I found this list. So I came into Al-Anon in uh, December of 1997. This was written in November of 2001, seven, eight, four years, math not my thing. Um, this was this was a list that I wrote called What Alice Wants. It's a very modest list. I want my own home. I want enough money to be comfortable, pay everything we owe, help our kids travel, and save for retirement. I want satisfying work, which is appropriate, rewarding, and pays well. I want time to write, take classes, and paint. I want a satisfying, intimate relationship with my mate, my children, and my friends. 
I want to be of use to God and my fellow humans. I want to show up with unconditional love and availability for anyone God puts in my path. I want to live in gratitude. I want to grow spiritually, even knowing it means continual self-examination and hard work. I have all this, which I read that and it gave me goosebumps because everything that's on this piece of paper has come true for me. And it's because of the work, every single thing, and it's because <coughs> of the work and the steps. Um, I made another uh, writing later where I, wrote, I just wrote down what I wanted on that piece too, and I put it up on my dream board, and everything on that came true too, everything on it. The only thing that hasn't happened yet is I do want to win the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> why not <laughs> and those people make you write the book first they won't just you know they don't give it to you you've got to write a book to get it so demanding so demanding um, so you know think big think about what you really want your life to look like and aim at that okay um, musical references this week, and I ask you guys to bring some if you had them. Deb is smiling at me. She's a big music person. Um, so my musical references this week are Show the Way, which is a David Wilcox so song that I just love. And it starts out, you say you have no hope. You have no reason to believe that the world will ever change. You're saying it's foolish to believe that there'll always be a crazy with an army or a knife to break you from your daydream and put the fear back in your life. And then this is the part I, I, I really love. Look, if someone wrote the play to glorify what's stronger than hate, would they not arrange the stage to look as if the hero came too late, almost in defeat? It's looking like the evil side will win, but on the edge of every seat from the time the whole thing began. It is love that mixed the mortar, and it's love that stacked these stones, and it's love that made the play here, though it looks like we're alone. In this scene set in shadow, when the night is here to stay, though there's evil all around us, it is love that shows the way. And in this darkness, love will show the way. Good song, right? It's very much what I believe. You know that it, it can look bad, friends. 20 years ago, my life was very frightening to me. You know, it's not that way anymore. And then John Hyatt, do you know this song, Have a Little Faith in Me? When the road is long and you can no longer see. Do you remember? Can't remember the rest of it. Come here, darling, from a whisper start and have a little faith in me, okay? So did you guys think of any musical references for step three? You weren't here last week. You I have one. Good, <laughs> yay, I, I thought you might. Do you want me to share? Yes! Um, mine's also David Wilcox. I just love him as a writer. And I was thinking about the first time that I ever did step three and I was in a really dark place. And so the song for me is, how did you find me here? Oh. And the, the line, that, the verse that I like is, um, I couldn't reach for rescue. I hid myself from you. I couldn't stand to see me from your point of view. Because mm -hmm. I know I'd disappoint you if I showed you to you this child that was shouting out, oh, that was crying out inside me, lost in the wild. Standing by the water, about to disappear. Ah. I feel you behind me. How did you find me? Yeah, that's David Wilcox, that's too. That's David Wilcox. And if I could share an additional story about this. Sure. This was brand new in a program for me. And I, somebody gave me this CD. And I love this song. And so I got an opportunity to hear him at Chautauqua. And it got to the end of the concert. And he hadn't played this song. He goes into the final song, and I'm getting upset, and he stops. And he's like, somebody needs to hear this song, and goes right into the <laughs> That late raises the hair on the back of my neck. Yeah, so. Cool, that's a beautiful song. It is a beautiful, and yeah. yeah. And now I know that I'm found. Yeah, 
Thanks, Deb. Thanks for, for letting me share that. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. So Carrie Newcomer, Van Morrison, David Wilcox is another one of those singers where if music <coughs> opens your heart, makes you think about things differently, check him out, dudes. Check him out. He's wonderful. Um, anybody else got, want to talk about a song? Gwyneth. I, one really quick. I, can th I don't even know what the song is. I just heard this line on the I heard some song on the radio, and it's like stuck with me the last few weeks. And the line that stuck with me was, stop fighting a fight that's already been won. Mm -hmm. huh. And that uh. just reminds me of this step, because it's like, oh yeah, like the surrender <laughs> aspect, right? Stop fighting a fight that's already been won. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's another line in the big book. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. That says, we cease fighting everyone and everything. We cease fighting. So I wanted to read you guys some poetry. Then we're going to talk about Indiana Jones. How exciting is that? <laughs> um, I think I'll read this one first. I have two poems for you tonight. This one's called I Want a God. I want a God. When he walked on water, he knew he could. And when he called out to the fishermen tipped high in the boat, the lake leveled at his voice. He gave them no magic, but spoke of faith. Had I been there when the graves heaved open, would I know power? I want a God big enough to throw me around, an altar within me to kneel bread for friends, wine for joy. This night near camp, there is no line between mountain, lake, and shore. If I could not hear the water or smell the damp, would I leap? Surrounded by the rags of evening shadows, I hear the water sigh and step forward. So, um, I'm not, um, I don't consider myself a Christian, but one of the stories that I like that's a, a Christian story is about Moses when he's at the Red Sea and the Israelite nation is lined up behind him and the army's chasing him and they're almost there, right? They're almost there. What Moses does is he prays, but he puts his foot in the water, right? He puts his foot in the water. In step three, my friends, to me, is me putting my foot in the water. And I, I don't feel safe doing this usually. Like I want it to feel like bunnies and kittens and flowers, <laughs> and it feels more like I'm gonna die, right? And so the Indiana Jones image that I wanted to mention you, to you guys is the one movie that he had, remember? He's trying to get out of that cave thing that he was in. And he comes out and he's on the edge of this cliff and there's another way forward across this giant chasm that's too big to jump. Do you guys remember this in Indiana Jones? Yeah. You can watch it again if you want to. It'll be so exciting. Which movie was it? I don't know. Watch all of them. <laughs> so there's this giant chasm and there's no way. He's stuck and trapped and going to die. And when he, he steps out, he literally puts his foot over the edge. And the minute he does that, he, it's an optical illusion, right? He can see that there's actually a rock bridge that goes from point A to point B. Say that. Is it the last crusade? Thank you for having a better memory than me. <laughs> Yay! See, it all works out in the end. Um, but I, I think it's so interesting that he could not see that until he put his foot over the edge, right? And that's kind of what step three feels like to me. It's putting my foot over the edge. And it's like, like oh, don't know what's going to happen. You know, I'm going to be different. What's that going to look like? What coping skills am I going to use now since I'm not supposed to use these anymore? Right? What's it all going to be like? I don't know. And I'm scared. I'm always scared when I do that. I am um, dealing with what my sponsor has referred to, the last bastion of self-will that I have. It's my favorite one. I love it so much. Um, and it's food. Whatever. <laughs> What's that got to do with Al-Anon? Everything for me. 
because whatever interferes with my relationship with other human beings and my higher power is a problem, right? So I started using food when I was six years old. That was, a, we could use three longs, a long, long, <laughs> long time ago. It was a long time ago, right? I haven't been six in a long time. Um, why did I use food? It doesn't even really matter. It made me feel better though, I can tell you that. I can tell you that much. Food made me feel better. So at my top weight, I was 286 pounds. I'm a good bit under that now. But, you know, it's not even so much about what I weigh, it's about what I go to instead of going to God. It's what I use instead of showing up with a broken heart maybe, <coughs> and people that I'm having trouble with and unconditional love, which is what God has kind of told me he wants me to do, right? I'm pretty clear about that. And so letting go of something I've used for that many years as a, um, to make me feel better, that's what it really does. It makes me feel better, you know? To let go of that has been difficult. So I started about four years ago. This is not going to feel like good news to you guys, but whatever. I started about <laughs> four years ago, and in four years, I lost 40 pounds. Who thinks I could sell that on the Internet? <laughs> Maybe not. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but um, there's been this struggle, right? Like in with me, because I have to eat. I can't not eat, right? Like you can't put the plug in the jug with food, <laughs> right? I have to eat. So working through this with my higher power has been so good for me. And it's put me right back through the steps again, right? Where I need a power greater than myself and enough humility to let people boss me around, not my favorite thing. Um, so I've joined another fellowship where they deal with the issues I'm having, imagine that. Um, and I'm following directions. And I'm so hopeful, you guys. I'm so hopeful that, uh, wow, you know, <laughs> this could go too? <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> I, I didn't think it would. I didn't, I didn't think this was gonna go for me. So um, when I work with people on step three, you know, I'm not blind to the difficulty of making a decision, you know, to let somebody other than me call the shots. I know how hard it is. And I think to not have respect for that is a huge disservice to people. Like we have to really have a lot of respect for what people are carrying and what they want to do with that, with God's help. So that's my little step three story. Um, another, I love pop references for recovery. And can somebody can just take a look at the time? I'm guessing. Oh my gosh, that was fast. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to talk real fast now. <laughs> just kidding. Um, another pop reference I like for step three is Shawshank Redemption, the movie. Really, a, a really quite a powerful movie. But here's what I want you to think about if you saw that movie. In that movie, there's a man who's been incarcerated since he was very, 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 very young, and he's an old man. He's the librarian at the prison, and he has a pet bird. You guys remember in this, that guy? Um, he does his time, and they let him out. And what happens to that man who remembers? He kills himself. He kills himself. Why? Yes. You can't... You can't go from here to here, you know, in recovery mm -hmm. without a lot of support. Recovery is about time. I believe time is for healing. It's literally why time exists for humans on the planet. Mm -hmm. Not sure there's any time where God is. Don't think God needs time. I need time. I need time to heal, right? So my suggestion about that gentleman who ended up not being able to survive living outside of prison was it would be good if they had just opened the door to his cell and said to him come and go as you'd like you know go out come back sleep here eat here see your buddies go out come back 
do whatever you need to do here until you're kind of ready to emancipate as a human being. And the steps are like that for me, you guys. So I don't want you to think that this was this was a 20 year overnight success story. <laughs> And that, that 20 years, I have devoted myself to working in the steps and working with other people, right? But it takes time, and it takes time to become a different human being. Um, also, I want to just mention grief. Grief is a good thing to think about when we're changing, because whenever we're changing, the grief process gets triggered. It just does. You know, you see me get teary talking about food. Why is that? The grief process gets triggered when we change. And what are the stages of grief? You guys, I bet you know this. Aren't you glad you came? I can pick on you. <laughs> Denial, anger, bargaining, yeah, depression, acceptance, right? Now, because of the way my brain works, I want that to look like 2.3 weeks of anger, uh, 1.7 weeks of bargaining. It, but for me, it, does, it never looks like that. It's all just a mess. <laughs> but if you agree to change, you can expect to feel angry and be in denial and bargain with God and be sad and move to acceptance back to anger, back to bargaining, until it's kind of resolved within you, right? And as a human being, you're entitled to that. You're Can I entitled. just add, when she entered into her own death process, she actually said about her writing, she's like, I had no clue what I was writing about. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Oh, that's interesting. Nothing like an up close and personal experience with something. Which right? is which is also for me about step three. It's like mm. it's a theory until it's an action, mm -hmm. and right. the action looks different than the theory. Right. Always, always. Good. Um, so I want to read you one more poem. Um, so I wrote this poem. That's the wrong one. This poem is called "Feet Know the Rhythm of the Ropes." And this is about something that happened to me when I was nine years old. Feet know the rhythm of the ropes. Children ate hearts at school on Valentine's Day. Piles of pink and red for the most deserving. My desktop covered only with the scratch scars of who sat there before me. I study the old names, head down. A linty cough drop, which I have slipped from my own pocket, dissolves in my mouth. I run my fingers slowly back and forth in the long groove of the pencil slot, open hinged wooden lid to search the well inside. Each book is stacked, their backs a perfect line. I won the double Dutch jump rope contest in 1968. My small caged heart, a hell bent chug of determination. I out jumped every girl in that school Heat from the tarred playground rising to redden my face. Kids cheering their surprise. Bodies pressing in around me. And I am shining girl just this once. My legs do not betray me. They know we are jumping for so much more than the prize. We are drumming my history into this ground. So I think it's interesting that all those years ago when I was a little girl, I had this feeling that there was something more for me, you know, that there was power that I could access if I was willing, and that there was something about my life that kind of needed to be pounded into the ground. I just think that's interesting. And really, letting go of the past, there's no solution in the past, friends. There's not one in the future either, so sorry. <laughs> there's only a solution right now, right? One of the other things I say to my sponsees when I'm working with them, especially if they have a lot going on and they're very afraid, I say, tell me right now, in this moment, while you sit on my couch and drink some tea and talk to me about things, is there anything wrong? Because there's not. 
like right now in this room with all of us here together willing to talk about these things and consider a higher power and tell the truth about our lives is there anything wrong there's not there's really not so the solution is for the present moment if you stay in the present moment long enough tell the truth work steps talk to your sponsor the future is going to change for you I believe I really believe over any significant time for me before program things got worse it was kind of grim over any significant period of time there are flat lots of flashes of joy lots of happiness lots of things but I was deteriorating because I didn't have a solution right since I came in and started working steps and really embraced this as a way of life <coughs> over any significant <coughs> period of time. God bless you. Since I started this journey, my life has done nothing but get better. That doesn't mean I'm exempt. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm a human. I have other humans I love. Mm -hmm. They do weird stuff. They get sick. It shouldn't be allowed, but it is. Um, so it's not about my circumstances being perfect, although my circumstances have improved so much. Mm -hmm. It's more about I have a solution that's real. And I have a way to, to, to call down that thunder, to bring in that power that comes from a power greater than myself, and to walk through whatever's happening. Um, my, uh, our daughter was on life support for a week about a year and a half ago, and nobody would tell me she was going to make it, which made me grumpy. <laughs> um, but, but she did make it. And the day they were taking her off life support, um, my husband and I were in the room with her. And, and it's a little bit of a intense <laughs> thing that happens, you know, that if you haven't ever seen it, it's like, oh, holy cow. Um, there's, the patient struggles mightily. It's, it's just, it's kind, it's kind of a thing. And after it was over, the nurses said to my husband and I, we've never seen anybody as relaxed, as supportive of us and it's helpful to this process as you were. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, <laughs> thanks God, <laughs> right? Because what was I doing when all that was happening? Anybody want to guess? Pray. I was praying. And I wasn't, I wasn't, I don't pray for miracles. I pray for God's strength and love no matter what's happening. That's what I pray for because that works for me. Miracles, I like miracles. Miracles are so much fun, but right we we don't predict what's going to happen and uh and for me it's better to pray for strength and love so who knows what time it is now is it only 20 after 22 after we got eight minutes so my friends in the big book of alcoholics anonymous there's this beautiful prayer it's referred to as the third step prayer and i wanted to talk a little bit about this prayer so I like to pray. I've, I've got lots of prayers that I love. This is my favorite prayer, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you why, in case it's helpful. <laughs> um, so it's up here on the board, um, and we're going to take it a, just a, a line at a time or so, if that's all right with everybody. So it starts out with the word, God, I offer myself to thee. Hmm. Imagine that. Why? To build with me and do with me as thou wilt. I surrender. I give. I got nothing. Help me, please. Relieve me of the bondage of self. Isn't that an interesting mm -hmm. phrase? What is the bondage of self, right? It's my self-will. It's the things I want to do instead of God's will. Right now, when I get to that line and I say, relieve me of the bondage of self, I say, God, please keep me safe from compulsive eating today, from compulsive food behaviors today, from my own arrogance, from my need to be right, you know, from all the ways I try to make myself feel safe that don't work. Like I, I stop there and I'm specific and I talk about what I'm currently working on. Why do I want to be relieved of the bondage of self? That I might better 
do thy will. That's the point, right? We're here to heal. We're here to help others heal. Take away my difficulties, right? Anything that feels like a difficulty is appropriate here, and you can name them. Got teenage kids? You know, this is a moment for you to talk about those babies <laughs> um, and to ask God to remove the difficulties that you're hand having, right? Having difficulties at work, have health cha challenges, take away my difficulties. To me, the difficulty is the struggle. It's the fight, right? It's not what's happening. It's my reaction to what's happening. Take away my difficult difficulties. Why? <laughs> that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help. Hallelujah. We're going to be able to help other humans. It's the coolest thing ever. So to those I would help of what? Of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Now for a while, it bothered me that power came before love. <laughs> because I'm a word person and that annoyed me. Um, but I think I got it figured out. God's love is his power. So, that, to, so I want to bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, right? They're together, thy way of life. May I do thy will always. This is a prayer that saves me when I'm having a rough time. This is a prayer I say daily more than one time a day. If I'm having a really rough time, I say it a lot. Um, other prayers work equally well, right? Mm -hmm. But I love this prayer, and I love that it comes from this book, right? And I think the guys that wrote this book all those years ago, wow, 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 wow. Do you know what page that's on? Yeah, I do. It is on 63-ish. It's 63. Yep, Thank you. page 63. Then it says we find it desirable to take this spiritual step with an understanding person such as our wife, best friend, or spiritual advisor or sponsor, right? This is when AA was brand spanking new, right? We have sponsors now, yay. Um, but it's better to meet God alone than with one who might misunderstand. Um, then, friends, it says these beautiful word, words. Next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action the first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us had never attempted. So it says that as soon as we've done step three, we launch out on a vigorous course, right? So it can, I, I've seen kind of difficulties increase if people get into the step work and they stall, right? And they stall. Step four can be super scary to people I'm not scared of it anymore. Initially, I was scared to death of it, but I've seen it work for me, so now I'm good, yay. Um, but it's important to work all of the steps. And step four is an important step. It's an archeological dig about you. You're gonna learn things about yourself. So next week, we're going to talk about step four. I'm gonna bring in my sponsor, because he's curious about what we're doing, and because he's brilliant, in my opinion. And he's going to help us work step four. Step four might take more than one week because we're going to actually write it out. Up on, I'm going to put sticky notes up, these giant ones, and we're going to do some inventory work together. So here's my ask of you this week. Pay attention to what pisses you off <laughs> this week. If you get mad for any reason. Now, let's say what does it mean if I get mad? Irritated rageful, slightly annoyed, uh, uh, anxious and worried, uh, critical and judgmental, um, uh, self-protective and uh, judgmental, defensive, right? <laughs> Self-righteous. So lots of people think, well, I don't, you know, like this was me, I don't really get mad. <laughs> um, and, I, and I didn't very much, right? So it helps me to break it down. It doesn't have to be like, fire coming out of my eyes, right? It can be annoyance, irritation. It can be milder than that. Because we're going we're gonna to put some live real time, if you guys are willing, and if somebody brings us something, 
we're going to put live inventory up on the board. If you guys, if nobody wants to do it, I'll pull out something I've done in the past. But I will tell you, friends, that the power really gets engaged in real time. Like when somebody's really got something going on and they're willing to write about it and share about it and walk it through the inventory to the end, which is when we get new ideas about what God would have us be, do, or believe about this mess. It can be, um, it's one of my favorite things because I mean, it can be cool, right? As we figure that stuff out, it can really be exciting and neat. So I'm gonna ask that of you. Um, we'll figure it out if nobody comes with anything. And, um, and I think it's probably about 6.30. Right on the cool. So we'll close with that. Thank you for your kind attention. Um, let's circle up and say a prayer.